gosh, he's heavy. It's a big one. You might have seen recently on an episode of Mighty Carmods that this box was pulled out from under the cabinet and inside was a golden light of sheer beauty, so unseen by human eyeballs good. ever before. Yep. What's inside it? What is inside the big box? Today, we're gonna find out. I'm on my way to New Plymouth from Christchurch. It's a little town. I've got to get a little plane there. Sometimes they're known as bug smashers. A while back, I was invited by Possum Board Motorsport in New Zealand to come and build the ultimate Subaru engine. I jumped at the chance, got on a plane and headed to the North Island, where I was met by Patrick, the owner of Possum Board Motorsport. Hey man. Yeah. You made it. Yeah. And I made it. <laughs> we jumped in the car and headed to our first stop. Creative CNC Solutions in New Plymouth, who have one of the key parts required to make this engine build a reality. I had a chat to Neil, who runs the shop and the machines. Yeah, I'm Neil Gray from um, Creative CNC in New Plymouth, New Zealand. We machine complex components out of any material. We have a Haas V5 machining centre, five axis. What's your interest in the sort of the car side of things? How does that work with your, with your business? Is that much of what you do? Uh, it has been quite a bit, yeah, motorsports um, and inherent. There's a lot of prototyping in motorsport. It takes you to be quite uh, quick at what you're doing because cost efficiency is probably a big thing and you don't get the same part twice often. Um, closed decking is probably a little bit different, there's a bit more of pr uh, production of that now but even then it's still small. We supply retailers with components to individuals. Um, so yeah, all, all sorts really. There's so many things that can potentially go wrong that you have to have right all the time. You don't have a spare block sitting there, so you, you've, you've got to get it right first time. So initially we set the fixture plate on the machine, we stone it down, make sure it's got no burrs or defects on it. We take the cast block and we blow that down, make sure there's no burrs or um, we give that a bit of a stone off as well. We prep that, make sure it's been um, vapour blasted first, so it's going to have some, um, some sand in it, so we clear all that out so that when it sits on the fixture it's nice and tight, nice and clean. We clamp, the, clamp it down, we set our datums, we have the program that we've prepared earlier is all ready to go. We set it up, start running through it, we, we have to set some tools up, tools specific for the job. Take the first cut, a witness cut, lets us know that the block and everything's in the right place and that all the material's where it should be. Move on from that to taking our rough cut and then a finished cut. We measure it to make sure that the size is right for the insert to fit in with some interference so that the insert's a good fit. After we've done that, we check it to make sure that we're back flat, parallel with the plane of the machine. And then we machine the top of the insert off and put the coolant galleries. And then that's it, magic's sort of all over. I pack them in a box and send them to Possum Born Motorsport and they turn them into motor magic. Very, very, very slowly. That's it. May all your horsepower dreams come true. Thanks so much. Legend. A major piece of our engine puzzle is now complete. The two engine block halves have had a closed deck insert installed and machined. This prevents movement of the cylinder walls and gives you the potential of much more power. After a drive through the North Island countryside, a little south of Auckland, we've come to Possumborn Motorsport. These guys work on all sorts of cars, but have a history with Subaru, servicing mods, upgrades, dyno tuning, race cars, the lot. The plan is to build the most powerful Subaru engine, that's New Zealander for Subaru, I've ever owned. And their in-house engine expert, Glenn, has been tasked with helping me get it done. So we're heading into the purpose-built engine clean room to start the job. So Glenn, there's an EZ30 exploded onto this very neat bench. Yes. So this is your this is your work area, this is really cool. Yeah, yeah, I'm quite lucky to have um, a work area that's this big and this tidy. Yeah. And um, yeah, so we can lay everything out like this. And so you've got a couple of other engines lying around here. I spotted something from an Evo. What else is there? Yeah, well, we've got a few Evos here. We've got um, the 4B motor, which we're starting to do a few of. Yeah, um, Evo a couple 10. Of, yeah, Evo 10. Um, also a couple of 4G63s that are different generation Evos. Nice. Um, Sabaros, the whole works. Yeah, I had a dream I owned an Evo once. Um, <laughs> How did that go? Yeah, it, it was all right. And then I woke up and back in Subaru land. Um, <laughs> but basically, so this, so here's our, EZ, this is our EZ30. So this has already been disassembled and cleaned and stuff like that. Where do we start? Right, so I've already gone through and done all the clearances and checked out everything like that um, before you got here. So um, it's pretty much at a stage now that we can start putting it together. Cool. 
So we're essentially going to be assembling this thing. Did all these bolts come out of the engine? Yes. Yep. So wow. <laughs> all these, they all came out of the motor and then we just got them, um, got them plated to make them look like brand new again. Oh, cool. Oh, and that looks great. Yeah, then we'll be putting oh, that's them... That's why they look brand new. Yeah. Oh, that's excellent. So um, we have that as an option for pretty much all the motors that we do. So yeah, we nice. get them vapor blasted so the castings all look like new. And yep. then um, we get the bolts all plated so it looks like a new motor by the time we get it back. Fantastic. All right, let's get into it. H6 EZ engines are a little more complex than their EJ four-cylinder cousins, but built ones are making good healthy power figures all over the world. I've chosen the 3 litre version because it has way more aftermarket support than the 3.6 that's in Supergrams. We'll be replacing nearly all the stock internal parts with strengthened items. How did you get into this doing um, this? I was quite lucky, I did my apprenticeship as an automotive machinist, so doing all the um, machining associated um, to an engine, um, so I was quite lucky part of that as well as doing all the machining, um, we would also assemble motors as well. So um, through my apprenticeship, I assembled quite a few motors and then um, I transitioned from doing that into getting into the high performance side of things where there are um, a few different things that you have to learn, but luckily we have the, the internet and all that out there and um, some good people um, to ask. So um, yeah, that's pretty much how, how I got into it. And how did you decide between doing this and a career as a radio presenter? Dude, you got like the best radio <laughs> voice I've ever heard in my whole life. Well, um, Possum Born um, rang me up and offered me this job and I haven't had a call from The Rock or anyone like that yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> so until enough. I get a call, we'll stay in this. All right, let's, let's get, man, this looks so nerdy and technical and awesome. I'm so excited. First things first, the block needs bearings. So we're slapping them straight in. Next up, the crank will be set in place and we'll check the thrust clearance, which is movement front to back. Everything has to be super clean when assembling the engine, so there'll be lots and lots of cleaning. Right, so we just want to make sure that there's like absolutely nothing in there that can um, can affect us. So, um, like doing it just before assembly is the perfect time because it hasn't had any time to sit around and, and get stuff on it or get stuff in it. Um, we're also cleaning it right now as well as because we've just got it back from um, from balancing. So there's potential for like foreign material to. Um, to be in there, so we're just washing down all the um, all the galleries and just brushing on all the journals um, just to get any um, any oils and that off, which the um, the machinist will normally put on to stop um, to stop rust. Right. So this is insurance policy. It's not just the crank that's going to get a bath. All of the parts in the rotating assembly is going to get a thorough wash down, then a blast out with compressed air, and then another clean with a solvent to finish it off. Even though we've just cleaned this, um, we'll go through and wipe all the journals down um, before we put it in the motor. With your magical lint-free cloth? Yes, it's the good stuff. The bearings can now be oiled up and we can test fit the crank. This is an important step as we really only want the crank moving in one direction when it's got 20 plus pounds of boost stuffed on top of it. You'll notice how short Subaru cranks are, having the pistons opposing each other. They are very different to assemble compared to a typical straight four or six. So this is thrust clearance, so front to back, right? You're going this way, and that little dial gauge has a little plunger thing on it. Yep, so... You can measure really accurately. I've got it at zero there, so it's pretty much on zero, pushing all the way back, and then we're yep. going to push it the other direction. And we've got about 0.07 of a millimetre there. So if we just refer to the factory manual and manual. find 0.03 to 0.11, and we've got 0.07, so... Um, we're happy. Here you can see, I go through and measure all your journal sizes or all your tunnel sizes and what clearance we end up um, getting. So um, we have all that information there for our purpose and the customer's purpose as well. Um, we try and put as much information as we can, even down to um, like the batch number of the parts that we're using yeah. and things like that. So now these, in there, in there, and then, and those, then them on that, <laughs> using some of these fancy gauges to make sure it all actually fits properly. Yes. Next in the build, connecting rods. We're using a high strength forged set by Pure Performance Motorsports. These are under a heap of stress in high power applications, transmitting the cylinder pressure created by the bang of the fuel into effort on the crankshaft. These are being treated to a custom set of bearings before being bolted together with specialty high strength fasteners. Same story with installing, we've got the the tang, which is just a locator. We're gonna put that so it's flush with the end. And we're gonna push in and kind of slide down at the same time. Nice. And she's in. 
The rod bolt's one of the most um, under load fasteners in the entire engine. Right. Um, so that's the one that's most most critical. So um, most uh, most bolts, um, basic ones, you'll see there um, they'll have a torque, and then you get the next step up, which is torque to yield. So there'll be a torque and an angle that you have to do. And then the most accurate um, out of all of them is uh, stretch. So we're going to be, um, we use that on all our motors and we're going to be using it on this one today. You don't really think about the fact that when you do up a bolt, it's getting longer. Yeah, as yeah. As you reef on it, but yeah. Yeah, it's all about getting the, the correct stretch so that it's um, under load, not too much, but just enough. Now these all have bearings. Next, these, using these, go onto that and then we have a rotating assembly, still with no pistons, and then that's ready to put into our two halves, then the halves go back together. I think, I'm learning. Yep, learning and loving watching an expert methodically and carefully assemble something that will be propelling my car to power levels I've never experienced before. This is truly a dream come true. The rods can be installed onto the crankshaft, bolted down and then torqued. A total of six rods in this flat six motor. It's probably worth mentioning that you can hit similar power figures that we're aiming for with a built four-cylinder EJ like the one we installed in the Lavore. Having owned both four- and six-cylinder Subarus, my favourite combination by far has been the turbocharged H6. The combination of modern engine design, smooth operation and power potential is something I'm very excited about. Proof of just how good they can be is that the engine in Supergrams has survived over seven years of hard driving, making nearly 400 horsepower at the wheels the entire time. 12 bolts later, she's in. We're done. So now you're just double checking? Yeah, so I just like to go through for my own peace of mind, even though I have marked them all, um, I just like to go through and double check. It's something that's really easy to do while it's here out on the bench. Yeah. A um, lot harder to do once it's in the car. And you would know from your paint marks if anything moves significantly, you'd see it, right? Yeah, so um, there's a few different ways to, um, to do the paint marks, but the way I do it for the rod bolts anyway is I have it so that the marks are pointing um, towards each other. Yep. So if something does move, then they won't be pointing towards each other. Um, another way to do it is to mark down the outside of yep. the cap, so you can see if there's a difference there. Oh yeah. Um, so yeah, so a few different ways to skin the cap. Rotating assembly, is that it? Yes. Yep. Awesome. Minus the pistons. <laughs> the fun bit. Yeah, so that will be the, the next, next bit of fun. One of the things that makes Subaru engines unique is that you've got two halves to your engine block which are bolted together. A layer of sealant is applied and then they can be torqued down. A layer of assembly lube is applied to the crankshaft and then with four hands it can be dropped into place. The corresponding con rods are pointed skyward, ready to receive their pistons, and the second half of the block can be lowered down on top. These holes that we machined in with the CNC, that's exactly what they're for. Their only purpose is to get the bolts in. If we just had the plate without these reliefs coating them, you can't actually stick your cases together. So this is fairly unique to Subaru life, um, but it works really well. So these get greased up so they can be torqued down properly under the heads again and on the threads, throw them in, torque them down, and our case, our block is stuck together. Are these the hardest Subaru engines to work on, do you reckon? Yes, so I've, I've built heaps of EJ20s and 25s yep. and um, I've done a um, couple of these now and a couple of the FAs and uh, yeah, these, these are the hardest. Most, compl most complex? Yeah, just due to the size and the components that they have, um, there's, a, there's a bit to them. It's mainly the size aspect, um, yeah. being, being the six cylinder and the way they're designed. And so pistons in last, is yeah. this just an EZ30 thing? Uh, no, EJ, EJ Same. thing, yep. Um, the only ones that don't do it that I'm aware of are the FAs and the um, 36s, because they have the... Lamb chops. Yeah, the lamb chops. That's rods that look like lamb chops. <laughs> that are apparently weak, but maybe we'll find out one day. Maybe we will. The remainder of our beautifully cleaned up engine case bolts can be reinstalled from our giant bucket of bits. And some yellow marker means we'll know if anything has moved. So that's it for case bolts. Yeah, that's, that's it for case bolts. Um, with the EZ, there is 
um, but that goes on the bottom of it, which is part of the case. Um, same as the FA motors. Um, it's so, this bit, right? Yep, yeah, that's that bit. Hiding down there. So um, that bit will be coming after we put all the pistons and that in. Yeah, so that's it, that's us now, which could potentially be the rest of the day, judging by how difficult <laughs> you said it can be. Yeah, yeah, it could be good, um, depending on how I hold my tongue. We'll see how we get on. So those in there. Yep. All right. Chasing more power requires more durable pistons. These are a little bit tricky to install into an EZ30, but Glenn is feeling confident. An organised and clean workspace always makes these jobs easier. So here we have pistons. Yes. Rings. Yep. Three for each one. Yes. And that you've already gapped them because that would take half a day. Yeah, it takes a long time, so I've gone and done all that. Set them up. Um, the pins. Yes. One, two, three, four, five. Six. Plus a custom tool one that I was playing with before. Um, and another custom tool you were saying to install the clips that hold the pins in. Yeah, I was wondering. Um, unfortunately, we didn't... Um, <laughs> um, we would normally get a piston that has either like a circlip with the holes in it yep. or um, get one that was designed to use the factory Subaru clip. But um, just with the, the time restraints that we had, this is, this is what we got. So um, we've got to make it work. So yeah, I made this this tool to be able to install them um, in place. Interesting. So this will be a bit of an experiment. Yeah, it'll be the, um, the first time that they've gone in and stayed in. I've played around a couple of times with, um, with putting them in without the motor all kind of together. So um, yeah, we'll see how this goes. See what happens. Factory Subaru pistons are often cast aluminium, great for mass production and conservative power outputs. We're using a JE piston which is forged and features a thickened ringland to help prevent the most common failures in this kind of engine. Forged pistons really are a requirement in a high power setup like this, but as always, the magic is also in the tune to help look after them long term. Through the magic of editing, we have six pistons ready to go with all the rings and now it's time to put them into the block now. These are determining our compression ratio, right? Because we've got standard length rods. Yes. Um, what else goes into sort of working that out? So you've got to take into account the throw of the crank as well, as long with the length of the rods, um, your cylinder size, um, and then your um, volume of your piston, yep. which is another big one, uh, your head gasket thickness, yep. and then the volume of the chambers in your heads. Right. So with all of those things all together, that's how you get your compression ratio. Yep. So we've, these engines are actually quite high comp. Um, that's for lots of reasons, emissions being one of them. Also, like, compression's a good thing, um, unless you're trying to stuff lots more of compression into it using turbos. Uh, so Supergram's currently with a 3.6 litre. It's a really high comp motor. That's why we have to run ethanol on it for it to do anything good. Um, 980 is basically just like a limp home tune in it currently. So this will allow us, would allow us to run this engine on 98 probably a lot more successfully because our compression is lower. So yes. we're not going to be hitting detonation walls as, as hard or as quickly. Um, but this is obviously still going to run ethanol because ethanol is freaking awesome. Um, so the next step for us now is to get these things into it, which is going to be tricky. Yeah, it's going to be interesting, especially with the, um, with the free cylinder design, so yeah. um, the fact that we've had to install the rods on the crank first and do all that, and then now we've got to put the piston in and try and get those clips in yeah. successfully. <laughs> so that will be the, um, the next mission that we undertake. Turbos and, and E85 feels like a long way away at yes. this point. At this point, yes, but it's closer than what we were before. Absolutely. All right. The middle piston on each side is the trickiest to install as you need to install the gudgeon pin and then hold it in with clips that are on either side of the piston. This means you have to reach through the other cylinders to install the pin after lining up the conrod perfectly and then use Glenn's special tool to insert the clip into place, holding the gudgeon pin in place inside the piston. So in case you've ever wondered why an engine build is expensive, this is just one of the reasons. She's in. 
Awesome, man. Cool. Okay. That looks good. It's first, first of many. So, pin next, right? Yeah, so we'll uh, push it down and get everything lined up um, so we can use that tool that I made to slip the pin in. Awesome. That's tricky to get in, isn't it, with that compressor because it's just, you can't have any gap between the top of the bore and the actual comp spring compressor itself. Yeah, and it's um, when we um, like machine, like bore and hone a block normally, we'd put a slight chamfer on the top to allow for the rings to go in, but um, for the EZ30, the um, edge of the gasket so close to the edge, you can't really yep. put too much of a, a chamfer on there. EZ30 so. being difficult again. Yes. <laughs> Dude, this is from proper keyhole surgery right now. Yeah. Far out. With custom tooling. Hopefully surgeons don't use custom tooling. <laughs> that they made in their back no, not, shed. Yeah, not this custom. So what I've got to do is... I've this is to, the hardest one though, isn't it? Yeah, so I've got to install the clip slightly differently to how I had it before because I had the, I was able to go around the piston like this. So yeah. I need... I found when I was doing a bit of trial and error that I had to space it out a bit differently without it buggering off. Tricky. So we've got two really difficult ones and then four slightly easier ones. But thanks to the magic of editing, you're only going to have to watch one of them. <laughs> Keeping meticulous records of the specs of the engine is all about having data. By testing different setups and recording everything, Glenn and the rest of the team can dial in the best combination of parts for power and longevity, which is the ultimate goal here. One half of the short block is done, now it's time to flip the engine over and do the other side. So our rotating assembly is installed. Yes, yeah, we got it all done, all the tools worked and um, it's all in place. Well done, man. You made yes. some tools and it actually worked. Awesome. That's very cool. No, so cool. now you're gonna check piston height again? Yeah, yeah, gonna check piston height again on this side. So um, we'll just go through and see how far above or below um, the pistons are. Yep. Um, so we can work out um, things like uh, what head gasket thickness we have to run and um, what compression ratio we're gonna end up having. Yep. So. And for anyone who's watching this, this has been probably minutes for them, but it's been a full day from us for at least already eight hours, probably going on nine hours. And so tomorrow, the plan is to put the heads together. Yes. So there are a lot of million pieces. So heads will go in, and the Savo though, we might still have time to do the sort of lower half of this motor, hey, and the sump and everything you're saying. Yeah, yeah, so um, hopefully today, depending on how time goes, we'll get all the the bottom half of the motor on and get the sump and all that on and um, have it all sumped by the end of today. Fantastic. Here's a fun fact about these engines as well. The bolts are numbered. One, I'm guessing that's two, three, four, five. How good's that? And it's actually cast in. Yeah. Is that unusual? Um, well, I haven't seen it on any, any other motor. Um, it's quite cool though. Um, this, um, this bottom half is like this and also the two front cover parts which have like 50 something bolts in them. So wow. it's quite cool, it's kind of like Paint, paint the numbers. Yeah, it makes it heaps easier. Yeah, definitely. So we bolt all this in, and then we're gonna put like an oil pickup and a tray, like a special tray that you made. Yes. Cool. You actually invented this. Developed it. Invented? Yeah, so, so the idea is not new, but you developed this one, is that no, correct? No, so the baffle sump idea has been around for ages, but um, yeah, myself and, and Possum Bourne, um, we went through and um, wanted to develop a baffled sump for the EZ30, because there wasn't one around. So this is cool. what we've come up with. That's really cool, man. You, in, you, you invented a thing. 
Yeah, and we've tried to make it in a way so that we can um, eventually it will be on sale to the public. Yeah. And um, we want to try and make install as easy as possible so all you guys can do it at home. Yeah, and I noticed from this it's got a big enough cutout. I imagine that's so that you don't have to remove your pickup. Yeah, correct. Because, I mean, that's... I mean, removing a sump is no biggie, really, but starting to pull this apart starting to get a bit more scary in terms of you get this wrong putting it back on or like the... Something, something's not right, then you can potentially launch your motor, which you don't want to do. No, exactly. So that's what we want to do. We wanted to make it real easy. So um, yeah, everyone could do it at home and it was just nice and simple. Cool. So we're going to throw it on? Yeah. We've got to add some silicon around it, I imagine. Yeah, we do. We've got to put some silicon on it so it doesn't leak oil. So um, we've got to put some silicon on this plate and also on the sump itself. All right. Um, and then it's dinner time. Are you starvo? Oh, I'm real starvo. I'm starvo, mate. man. I don't know if that's an Australian term or a New Zealand term, but let's just say it's New Zealand term oh, from now on. I'll say it's Aussie. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> We've got the lower part of the block on the engine. We're calling it lower part of the block because I don't actually know what it's called. Um, it's not really a sump, but it holds the sump, but it sort of is the sump. Anyway, so the next step now is to put on our oil pickup, put our mad baffle plate on, put the sump on, and then go and get dinner because I'm starvo. That's actually the truth, I'm starvo. <laughs> let's put it on. plate here which has also been cleaned and plated and looks freaking awesome is the trigger wheel for the crank angle sensor you can see a bunch of teeth on it and then you can see bits that are missing and with that Haltech in our case can calculate exactly where the crank is positioned which pistons where that combined with the cam angle sensors allows us to do our full sequential ignition and injection and awesomeness this goes right here short block done now it's time to move on to the heads so Glenn these are our heads now they look really clean and you've already done a little bit of work to these before here's one we prepared earlier type thing right yeah exactly so um i've gone through and given the heads a bit of a, a light port for you um the just cleaning up some of the casting and stuff like that nothing too major yep. also um within the chamber going through and deshrouding all the valves so just removing any excess material that's around the seat that doesn't need to be there so done that, and we've also vapor blasted it like everything else. Yep. Makes it come up all nice. And cleaned out the insides as well, right? Like I noticed some of these bungs look new. Yep, yep. So um, we always take all the bungs out when we do it and um, clean out the galleries, make sure there's nothing in there to block up any of the oil passages. Awesome. So first step's going to be valve stem seals? Yeah, so we'll put the valve stem seals on. Um, and then once we've got the stem seals on, we can go and start putting valves and springs and all that good stuff in. Being a flat engine, we've got two heads to deal with instead of just one. We're going to be installing the valves, valve springs, cams and all the bits that hold them together before we can slap these onto our freshly finished short block. All these parts have already had hours put into them before we've even got to this point. There's really no getting away from the fact that builds like this take lots and lots of time. It looks excellent, man. So clean. Yeah, nice with the new valves in there too. Yeah. Awesome. Do we do the other one now or do we flip it over and keep going on this one? No, we'll do the other one now. For this particular build, we're going to be using the factory cams but upgrading the valve springs. This is partly due to the lack of availability of aftermarket cams and partly due to the fact this engine has a version of VTEC which allows it to breathe pretty well throughout the rev range. More on that later. Stronger valve springs help control the operation of the valves better at high power output and high RPM. So now the heads go over to your special valve machine. Yes. There's probably a proper name for it, isn't there? Not valve machine. Valve machine sounds kind of cool though. Yeah, it does. Um, no, I don't know. Yes, uh, cylinder head assembler and disassembler. Sure. Basically yeah. it means you can use your foot to hold it down. Yes. This thing's pretty cool. So you've got a, a foot thing that controls a pressy thing that presses it all down so you can stick a little retainer in. Yeah, look at it go. The robots. They can just do anything. One day a robot will do this, although it probably won't. <laughs> I think I've got a few uh, years left in my job. A few years to go, yeah, yeah, for sure. As long as people want to go fast and blow up their engines. I'm here. <laughs> With
with the valve train installed, we can take this opportunity to work out our static compression ratio. Very helpful to know for when we are tuning. We're going to um, check how many cc's of fluid um, it takes to fill this chamber. That's part of the um, compression ratio calculation. Um, from that um, we can decide if we're going to take some more off the head to raise the compression or um, if we're going to use different thickness head gaskets, um, all of that. Step one is to install a spark plug to block the chamber off. Then a measured amount of fluid can be dropped into the chamber which is sealed with a plastic plate. The plate is locked down with some grease which prevents the fluid from draining away. And from this we can see exactly how many millilitres it took to fill up that space. Along with information about our pistons, we can work out the static compression ratio. And there we go, so we've got no air bubbles in our chamber, which is what we want. We also want to have a quick check around to make sure that none of the fluid's um, leaking out. So if you're doing this um, without the proper valve springs in the head, you might want to put a little bit of oil or Vaseline or something in behind the valves. So we're just going to have a quick look down the chambers, see if there's any of the fluid running out. Um, we use a, um, something that's got a bit of colour to it just so it makes it easier to see as well if it's leaking. So we can't see anything that's leaking out there. So now we'll have a look at our measuring device here. And we see that's used 44.5 um, um, mil or cc's. So with that there, we can put that into the equation to figure out what it is going to be for the compression ratio. 8.98 to 1 is our compression ratio. Yeah, yeah, so that will be a good um, compression ratio for flex fuel and um, allowing um, you guys to add a bit of boost to it and play around with that as well. So it's going to be something that's um, that's nice and, and safe for 98, 85. Totally. Lot, lots of boost. Yeah, man, it's all about boost and we'll have plenty of that available. Getting to an exciting point of the build now, it's head gasket time and head stud time. Um, these are a little bit special because it's actually got a different thread on either end um, and that's because we want, we want more clamping force, right? Yeah. But we can't go too hard because then we could potentially ruin a head. Is that what happened? Yeah, exactly. And we want um, the, it's bigger on the bottom here so we've got more meat to grab onto in the block itself. Yeah. So um, it gets tapped out to a bigger size just so we get better thread engagement. A common, because a common modification is putting really big head studs. Like I know in EJ's you can, it goes from like an 11 mil potentially to a 14 mil, yeah. which is a massive change. We don't have the meat in our engine to do that. No. So instead we've gone from 11 to 12? Yes. Okay, so 12 in the bottom and 11 in the head. Yes, correct. And it means with that that we don't have to go drilling out head gaskets and drilling out the heads and everything like that. So, so we, can, we can use this. So this is a multi-layer steel comedic head gasket. Um, this is one millimetre. I think a factory one is half a mil? Yes. Half a mil. So this is it's slightly thicker to take up because we've basically had so many changes in there. Um, and we had to include this calculation, our compression ratio calculation, which as you saw is just on nine to one, or the exact very accurate people here would say it's 8.98 <laughs> um, to one. So we're gonna throw our head bolts in and we're gonna get our gaskets on and then we can look at putting our heads onto the block. Man. When you're adding lots of cylinder pressure with a turbo, the head and the block are constantly trying to push away from each other. The job of the head studs is to hold the head down securely and help the head gasket do its job. These specific head studs required the block to be machined to accept them, but they fit the stock heads. There's a specific torque sequence that has to be followed to fasten them properly. The basics of a forged engine is usually pistons, rods, bearings and head studs at a minimum. Once the heads and block are reunited and everything is torqued, we can look at installing the rest of our valve train items like the buckets and the fancy VTEC style cams. Our heads are on the block. Um, it's starting to look like an engine again, yeah. which is pretty cool. And so now, as I understand it, our next step is cams and buckets. Now, there's a few differences as well. So obviously, Supergrams has had an EZ36 in it for a long time, 3.6 litre, sort of the biggest big daddy engine that Subaru make. EZ30 is its smaller brother, only a little bit smaller at three litres, but it has a few differences. One, it's got one less bank of cam, cam control, but what it does have that an EZ36 doesn't is essentially VTEC. Well, sort of VTEC. Um, there's more than one cam load profile, as you can see, and it is hydraulically adjusted. A lot of cars do have that with variable valve lifty stuff. Mm. Yes. But this is this is sort of one step more, right, than just changing an ex uh, in or intake or an out uh, an exhaust cam yeah. position. Yeah. So this has both um, variable valve lift and variable valve um, not variable um, cam position as well. So right. It's yep. something that's um, pretty unique. 
variable valve lift. That's what yes. I was looking for. Um, and so one of the other differences as well is that you've got what would be considered a normal bucket. Yes. It's the right name for that. So that goes over the top of the valve thing and then this pushes on it and away you go. You make kilowatts. Um, but this one, which is on the intake, yes. that's got a proper like hydraulically adjustable little sort of plunger in there that changes profile when you put oil pressure to it. Is that the way, did I get that right? Yeah, 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 that's correct. And, and, what, and what, under what circumstances would that change and how would it change? So um, pretty much under at like the lower RPMs and stuff like that, it would run on the low lift cam the, load. The which, small one there, yeah. Yeah, the one that you can see in the middle, and it's got a slightly different shape to it, that low lift one. So yep. it would pretty much run on that, and it would push down on the outside of the bucket. Now, there's a spring in that inside the bucket. Yep. So um, once you get to a certain point, which would be determined by the ECU, yep. um, it would feed oil into that bucket, which would lock it, and then um, from blocking it, it would use these um, higher lift um, lobes. So it's it's pretty much the exact same as VTEC, except VTEC works with like um, a follower rocker style, where this is direct cam over bucket. Right. So basically, more breathing at high RPM is the idea. Yes. And no doubt, probably emissions um, is a big reason why they do something like this. Yeah. But it's great. Like it's a high tech engine. It's pretty modern, and this is just another um, option that we have when tuning to try and get like the best performance both power and drivability. So this will potentially help make up for some of the what we lose in terms of capacity by going down to a three litre. Uh, but as you can see from the quality of the stuff going into this three litre, I don't think power is going to be an issue. No. Um, so what's our process now? What do we do? So um, we'll go and fit all the, um, the buckets into the head itself. Um, now when the heads came back from machining, um, I've gone through and um, set all the lash yep. already. So we've just got to go put it in. We'll double check it to see that it's all right. And lash um, is the distance of the cam off this, so it's yeah, not hitting correct. too big? Yeah, so just when everything heats up so that um, right. it's not holding a valve open. Yep. Um, so yeah, we'll go through and check all that, bolt all the cams in, and um, when she'll be good, we'll the go from there. Top end's more or less done, right? Yeah, pretty much. We can chuck the rock covers on and keep on going. side done. Yeah, all done now. So um, we're just going to leave the rock cover off just so um, when we time it all up, we can kind of... Can enjoy looking at it, yeah, basically. Good enough reason. That way? Yep. Let's go. Head's done, cam's done. Cam's done, yeah. So um, we're going to leave the rock covers off like we said before and um, start putting the front cover and getting all the timing components on. Man, I can see so many bolt holes. Yeah. I've never seen so many. Oh, there's a lot. It's there, huge. There'd be over a hundred just in the front covers alone. Yeah, nice. There are 45 bolts in total on the cover of this thing. I reckon we're about half done. And next is oil pump. Yeah, we'll put in the oil pump and then we can start putting in um, the cam gears and water pump and um, get it all timed up. Make it look like an engine again. Yeah. This is timing chain as well, which is a little bit different from the EJs that we've worked on in like Miss Daisy and various other cars. So a little bit more complex, but nice and strong.
EZ30 is looking pretty awesome. Water pumps in, timing chain on, one timing chain to go. Covers, manifold at the top, and then it will make its way to Australia. Now, I also have to make my way to Australia because my visa just ran out. I'm not allowed to stay any longer. Uh, but when this motor gets back to Australia and gets shipped over, there'll be a few extra things that I'll still have to do, injectors, and obviously things like wiring looms and other things that have to be completely customized. But this engine will leave here pretty much ready to fire up. Um, just have to put some oil in it, then we've got to do all the usual run-in procedures and everything. It's pretty exciting. I don't think I've ever had a car with a properly like built from scratch engine before. So I'll be very, very interested to see what kind of power this thing is going to make. It's been an awesome experience working with Glenn, Pat and the guys at Possumborn Motorsport. As you can probably see by now, building an EZ30 is a huge job. The CNC closed decking, engine machine work, forged internals and expert assembly has created something that I am so excited to get into a car, strap a turbo to and send it to the moon. Thanks Pat. Really good. You're a legend man. Yeah. Thank you for lending us your Thanks. workshop, your time, no your problem. awesome talented people. <laughs> Thank you for coming over. Muchly appreciated. Thanks dudes. Good, I'm going to go get a plane because my visa just expired and they want to get rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> See you dudes.